Welcome to Study with the Best, the magazine show that's all about CUNY. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today we're at Hunter College and we'll explore religion and spirituality through the CUNY lens. We'll learn about everything from humanism to shamanism and so much more. But first, a graduate from right here at Hunter College has taken his religious themed work to new heights with his recent commission at a church in Brooklyn. This is the Undercroft at St. John's Church in Park Slope. What we're looking at is a mural that I've been working on for the past six months. It's been one of the biggest projects that I've done since graduating from Divinity School. The room is divided um, into Old Testament and New Testament. There's a lot of crossover. The same colors are used, some of the same figures, the same landscapes. We don't want to reinforce this divide between the Old Testament and New Testament because they're both seamless wisdom traditions. The most important thing is that it's immersive, right? You, you walk in and you're immediately hit with a sense of being in some new space. This is a 200-year-old church. They have a new priest who is ambitious and wants to introduce Christian theology to people in a way that they haven't seen before. We're always sort of seeking to um, render things in an unexpected way. So for instance, Adam and Eve are not shown as Eve coming out of Adam's rib, but there's another creation story in, in Genesis of Adam and Eve being raised from the dust, which is where we get the expression ashes to ashes, dust to dust. One of the biggest philosophical underpinnings of this project is to um, respect the wisdom tradition but bring it into the contemporary world. So we wanted to use real people, um, congregation members primarily, um, as models in the mural. All of these people here are congregation members. All of those kids are congregation members. The priest is featured on the door along with another congregation member. The Apostle Paul is actually a um, religion professor at Hunter. There's dozens of figures in this mural. Um, and they're all doing very specific things, telling very specific stories, because this is all about, in the end, storytelling. In order to emphasize to this church and to this priest, the most important wall is the wall with the resurrection. I don't feel qualified to make a portrait of Jesus Christ. I don't feel qualified. I also think it's antithetical to what we're doing here to try to pin Jesus Christ down as one particular person because really this is an idea that we're talking about. And I thought that we needed a big wall with no figures on it because there's figures all over everywhere else, right? So in a way, you emphasize the importance of this wall by making it different from all the other ones. What historians think is that um, the cross probably was just a beam nailed up to a dead tree. This is a neat way of using historical accuracy um, uh, with uh, the idea of the tree of life. And then, have you ever seen a tree that's been sort of decapitated or cut down, but it won't give up? It still sprouts? So it's just sort of working with that idea as well. So working with allegory, uh, which is a really neat fit with the story of the resurrection. Making a living doing detailed representational painting in the contemporary art market world was quite difficult. I decided I would try to go back to school. And at this point, I'm like 40 years old. Went to the CUNY BA program, um, which is a, a wonderful program that sort of took me in and listened to what I wanted to do and um, really empowered me. They paid me to go to Nepal to study Buddhist painting techniques in Buddhist monasteries for five months. I started CUNY with a, a 1.67 grade point average, um, and I ended up at Harvard Divinity School. It was a really sort of dramatic journey upwards. And Divinity School is where I really wanted to try to bring in the two disparate threads of my life, which are art and religious study. I'm studying with people that are going to be chaplains and priests and imams and like spiritual caregivers, right? So I was really impressed with these people. Sitting with them and talking to them about how it is that they uh, work with people who are uh, broken in some way, that have undergone some kind of trauma. 
um, was the genesis for the first series of sculptures that I did at Harvard. The big idea that I got from it is that they teach the people this idea of bouncing back is you don't You don't really bounce back from something like mutilation. You can only put yourself together in a new way. In order to reflect that idea, I just started breaking fragile things and putting them back together. Um, I started with eggshells, trying to put the eggshell, it's crazy, trying to put the eggshell back together the way it was, and you can't do it. But you can put it together in a new way. So that's where you see the images of like the broken goblets. My task is to illuminate wisdom traditions using what I know about visual art. The problem isn't how to paint, the problem is what to paint and why. I've just always been interested in all religions um, and using those things as my most passionate subject matter bore the, the best fruit artistically. Shamanism is an indigenous and ancient spiritual practice often associated with remote and rural areas. But two CUNY teachers are about to show us that shamanism is alive and thriving in New York City. When, you know, I meet people who live in rural places, you know, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, upstate New York, Maine, and they hear I live in New York and I tell them, I feel quite often that I'm on the front line of the spiritual and humankind battlefield because there are millions of people in need and there are millions of people hurting and there are millions of people who have emotions that are out of balance or have experienced energetic assault on a pretty regular basis. Okay, now we begin. Ho, ho, yo, ho, hey, hey, yo, ho, yo, ho. There are a lot of people who practice shamanism in the city. It's a direct relationship with spirit. We don't have to take ourselves to church or temple or mosque. I can be riding on a subway. In that half hour, 45 minutes, however long I might be in transit someplace, I can take myself to a more spiritual realm. Shamanism addresses the spiritual causes of imbalance within the individual. In some traditions, that's done with what we call plant medicine, ayahuasca, peyote, all sorts of uh, plants that uh, create this altered state of consciousness. The Foundation for Shamanic Studies removed that, uh, that form of uh, creating an altered state by uh, focusing on the universal traditions of the rhythmic beating of a drum or a rattle. Tony just had a drum circle the other day. He does them Monday nights, once a month. Rather small. And, and in that smallness, it's intimate. And the drumming brings the heartbeat together so that all of us, at some point, are syncopated in our beats. The word shaman comes from Siberia. It means he who sees in the dark. All prehistoric communities had somebody who was designated as the healer. These communities, which were comprised of maybe 25 or 100 individuals living in these small communal tribes, the well-being of the tribes depended on the healer, the shaman. If one of the members of that community was injured in any way, psychologically, physically, emotionally, and they were not able to function as part of that tribe, as part of that community. It was the responsibility of the healer to restore them back into balance and wellness for the benefit of the community. 
And we've gotten so far away from that as we have grown into these very large communities of towns, villages, and cities. So quite often people come to me or other shamanic practitioners many, many years after the trauma or the situation which caused their condition has actually taken place. In New York City, I think sometimes that's what saves us, is that we have some kind of spiritual practice. And for me, it's shamanism. For a number of people that I know, it's shamanism. We wish to send this tobacco to our loved ones in the Milky Way. <laughs> we spoke with a John Jay professor and ethnomusicologist to learn more about music within the context of religion and spirituality. I've been involved with the study of Tibetan Buddhism for all my adult life, so that's more than 40 years. This is a sitar, this is a very modern version of the sitar. Part of its ancestry is an ancient Indian stringed instrument revered by Hindus called the veena. The emblem of the goddess Saraswati, who is a patroness of music and learning. The most direct ancestry of the sitar, however, is probably a Persian or Afghan instrument known as the tambour. But like many ecstatic branches of religion, be it Hinduism with its devotional bhakti uh, or Judaism with its ecstatic Hasidism and Kabbalah, or evangelical Christianity, or Sufism, the ecstatic use of music is used as a vehicle to get closer to the divine. There's a very worked out aesthetic. This is classical music. There are lots of rules um, on how, uh, to perform in a melodic form, what is known as a raga. Uh, and people often view these classical performances as being a type of meditation. There is a meditative quality to it. If you are, say, developing an, a, an improvisation in a melody form, you are meditating on the shape of it. You're slowly spinning out its shape. After 9-11, specifically graduate study in music saved me. I had been a, a software engineer on Wall Street. I was standing right in front of the Trade Center in Zuccotti Park when the second plane hit. I had worked in Two World Trade and I witnessed about a hundred of my friends and colleagues get vaporized. I'm a mixture of Ashkenazic and Tejano. I was raised with no religion 
was studying about mu music and religion in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, so uh, I had that exposure, I considered all this, and I embraced Buddhism as an adult, as a young adult. But I've been closely involved with Hindu culture through the, the performing arts and um, with Islam, similarly. As far as I'm concerned, it's all about inclusion, about finding our commonalities. And music helps us to find that, the most open aspects of spirituality slash religion allow that. I'm teaching in a criminal justice college to cultivate the humanistic as it relates to justice and social action. And my music aids me with that as I aim to instill that in my teaching of young people, many of whom will be future law enforcement officers and other people who will help society. Sometimes exploring a spiritual path can take you away from your academics. Ari Goldberg met a former Hare Krishna who took a road less traveled to become a student here at Hunter College. I'm Ari Goldberg for Study with the Best. In the Sanskrit language, bhakti means devotion. We're here at the Bhakti Center on the Lower East Side. Doyal Garunga is a Hare Krishna practitioner and program director of the Bhakti Center. He's also an undergrad at Hunter College, but you'll find him listed in the registrar there under his legal name, David Bartoloni. Doyal's not your given name, your, your birth name, so I take it you were not born into a Krishna tradition. No, I wasn't actually. I was born into a Roman Catholic family in Southern California, um, Italian background, um, and I grew up going to church. And when I got into high school, I started, junior high, high school even, I just started really exploring spirituality from a broader perspective. It wasn't until I got into college, somebody gave me a copy of the Bhagavad Gita, which was a text from India, and I didn't know anything. I, I probably couldn't find India on a map, if you asked me. I'd never heard of Krishna before, never heard of, you know, Hare Krishna or anything like that. But I was just very, very, very intrigued. And after finishing that first year of college at UC Irvine, I dropped out and I just, moved into the ashram there and I became a monk. And I, I lived there for five years um, as a monk in the temple. From a Western stereotype cultural perspective, people probably wouldn't look at you and think monk. Being a monk um, for us or for me really had nothing to do with age or even location of living. Um, it meant more of a lifestyle that uh, dedicating oneself to spirituality in a very focused, concentrated way. So it meant sacrificing a personal relationships to a degree, um, romantic relationships for the purpose of just focusing on my own per personal spiritual development. Growing up in a Western culture, most people don't have exposure to these Eastern sort of philosophies and faiths. Can you just talk broadly about what Krishna means? In the Western world, in the 60s, it became popular as the Hare Krishnas, which was just like this kind of phrase that people associated with weird people walking around the streets in sheets and bedrobes. We practice Krishna Bhakti, which is devotion towards the Supreme, who we refer to as Krishna, which means the source of all beauty or the most attractive and beautiful. Ways that we express our devotion in Krishna Bhakti or as, as devotees of Krishna, a large one is through Kirtan, which is through prayer and meditation. Through Kirtan is the devotional singing of Krishna's name, um, with music and in community. When you walk by Union Square and you see people chanting, they're doing kirtan. That's why the Bhakti Center is here. To take this very um, different, very uh, seemingly foreign tradition and make it accessible for a Western audience, somebody that would never approach it because of the cultural barriers, um, but would have so much to benefit from if they just were able to experience. At age 32 now, after 10 years as a monk, Doyal decided he was ready for a new chapter. He is now married and studying social work at Hunter College. 
two things he never thought he'd be doing as an 18-year-old entering an ashram monastery. So I went back to school. I'm studying social work, and my plan is to, um, after getting my master's in social work, to um, get a license to practice therapy and counseling. I definitely see that my work here at the Bhakti Center and in my spiritual life complementing you know, the professional work that I want to do in social work. But just listening to people, giving people a space to tell their story and then exploring that journey with them and helping people kind of unpack their lives in a way that allows them to put it back together in a meaningful way. And that openness is a lot of what the Bhakti Center is all about. Community is the key. You don't need to be practicing or Hindu to be welcome to drop in and explore what the center has to offer, secularly or otherwise. And definitely anybody can come to any of our programs. There's no membership required or, you know, a declaration of faith to come to anything. And that's really what it's, what it's meant for. You can come to a yoga class, you can come to a wisdom course, or you can come to our art gallery, and you can just appreciate it on whatever level is attractive to you. Because we believe that there's always a benefit somebody coming and being in a spiritual atmosphere, being in a spiritual environment, being around spiritual people. Everybody's on their own path, and, and who am I or who are we to tell you, you know, how to walk your path? All we can do is offer things that we found helpful in our life, that we feel are helpful for your life. I mean, we are a nonprofit organization. We're, we're, we're trying to serve society in some way. What do you call people who don't believe in God? An atheist? Agnostic? Well, have you heard of a humanist? A professor at Medgar Evers College explains. The lack of acceptance of a personal deity leads us to a humanistic point of view where the locus of power and control of our daily lives and destiny resides strictly in the hands of each of us to maintain. Humanism is essentially a philosophy of action which leads those who partake to freely inquire about themselves and the universe, while also placing the responsibility and means to improve our individual and collective lives squarely in the hands of humanity. I have been fascinated by the same fundamental questions that I think have been asked by all humans for thousands of years. You know, how did we get here? Why are we here? And why we, where are we going? I was raised Roman Catholic uh, in a small village in Western New York and, and loved my upbringing. So I didn't so much repudiate Catholicism as I did you know, evolve into a humanist. Ideas of freedom, justice, happiness, equality, fairness, and all the other values we may live by are human inventions. Humanism is both an inspiration and an advocacy to living one's life ethically and morally, but without a theistic center, without the need for the divine. Humanism is a philosophy, a human stance, and sometimes a religion for people who take their lives seriously as ethical beings understanding science, understanding nature, that humans are a part of the fabric of nature, is absolutely one of the tenets of modern humanists and certainly part of the Humanist Manifesto. Human beings have always marked the important events of life, like births and marriages and commemorated people who have died. We do it still today, and for those of us with no religious beliefs, it's important that we can mark these occasions with honesty, warmth and affection. People tend to come through two different roads to the same conclusion. Either at one time you had religious faith and then you lost it because of some event or some reading that you did or some, something that happened in your life that was a triggering experience for you to say, I'm going to rethink my spirituality. The second way, and, and this was my way, as being someone who never really had a religious bone in his body, if you will. Um, that is, it was not part of my community. It was not necessarily uh, a big part of my family's experience. And so therefore, it really wasn't a big part of my experience growing up. What the purpose of the book is to do is to show that there are 
many thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who are non-believers, who are doing the same good work, but not doing to serve a spiritual, in the sense of a religion, or the sense if I do good works here, I'll get payoff in my next life. But what most humanists will believe is that this is our only time on the planet. How are we going to make it better for ourselves? And in consequence, how are we going to make it better for those around us and the communities that we know and we don't know? A very important tenet of, of humanism is our own personal responsibility for our actions. And so we take very seriously our own personal moral agency. We go to the front of Black Lives Matter and the environment and all these things, but we also make sure that in our own communities, we're behaving ethically towards one another. The New York Society for Ethical Culture was founded in 1876 by Felix Adler as a non-theistic religion of ethics. He founded this uh, society uh, not as a humanist, but as an ethical culturist, because he said it is our moral obligation, our religious duty to cultivate ethics, that that's the most important thing, that we put deed above creed. This is a community that takes ethics seriously, that takes relationships seriously. We meet on a regular basis, in our case on Sundays. We have an Ethics for Family program and uh, it really emphasizes that uh, children are ethical already. Um, and our role as parents and teachers is to encourage them to grow into their own consciences and to become the moral agents that they're meant to be. You can be an activist in many different ways. Your activism may be that you are politically active. You go to rallies, or an alternative is, let's say you can't physically give your time, but you can give your money. Thought leaders within the non-belief community uh, who you know write books, which could lead to other forms of activism as well. As long as there has been religion and the, and the need or the belief in the divine, I think that there have been parallels in our own humanity where there are people who reject the divine for the sake of living a humanistic life which is based in the observable, the natural setting, the human compassion, the empathy that we build for each other without the need for, for, for the divine. That's our show for today. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at cuny.tv or check out our Study with the Best Facebook page. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.